Wow. <rire> Uh, warm welcome to the How Hebel I Move. Uh, uh, warm welcome to Berlinale Talents. It has been an amazing week so far, and it's my utmost pleasure again, not to introduce the guest, but to introduce you as our audience, as our partners, friends, uh, filmmakers, of course, talents, everyone, because this house here has been filled with so many wonderful vibes and energies over the week, and I think we will do another peak here today. Um, and as always, before we introduce guests, we also ask you to introduce to each other just very silently. So have a look around on the left and on the right side, because creating community is what Berlinale Talents is about. And creating community for me is really about bringing the moderator on stage as long as I want to hesitate anymore. And he is here, Anas Sarin. Please welcome him on stage. Hello. So. Good evening. Um, I'm Anna Serene. I'm part of the selection committee for features at Generation, but my first home at the Berlinale is at Talents. So I'm delighted to be back on the stage uh, to enter in conversation with some of the most high flying artists um, of our generation. So thank you very much for being here. Welcome back as well. It's been a while. Um, and yeah, thank you. Um, it's a dangerous thing to meet your heroes, but that's exactly what I'm going to do tonight. These filmmakers and artists are people that I've been watching for the last 15 years, ever since I discovered what film was, really. And the dedication with which they come to their craft is something utterly powerful and beautiful. And they put this in everything they do, especially in the film that we're going to talk about tonight, Todd Field's Tower. So please join me in welcoming Hildur Gutnatodir. <laughs> Sophie Cower. <laughs> Nina Hoss. Kate Blanchett. And a maestro of a director, Todd Field. I think there's a bit of a photo call with all of you just, just here for now. I'll step away for a second. We were told you would go away. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, thanks. I'm going to have to photobomb this if you continue.
Right. OK. I'm glad that's uh, done with. I guess the first thing to say is welcome home, because this film became a reality in this city. And it's in the background and yet in the foreground at some times, especially in the second half or the last half of the film. But like a good parent after a long business trip told you come bearing gifts, and we'll see one of them um, in about 40 minutes time, which is called The Fundraiser. And I'm delighted that this is the first time the film's going to be shown, so I'm delighted to uh, be able to share it with the audience here. I guess, um, perhaps to start off, was it always obvious to you that Berlin should be the home of the of Thai? Uh, yes, it was. It was always. It was always going to be Berlin. There was no other place. I knew that even before I started the script. Um, it, yeah. Yes. Are we talking, or we being photographed? I hope we're talking, and I please ask all the photographers to respect that and leave. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Next to you. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> Take two. This is a rehearsal movie, and we can start again. Um, you were talking about Berlin being obvious. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, this this character is um, an American that's being photographed while we're talking. Um, <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! Stop it, sir! It's very disrespectful. Please stop. Right, I'm really sorry, guys. No, no, no. It's, it, it, um, it, so, I mean, Lydia Tarr, how many of you have seen the film? Ha show of hands? Okay, okay, all right. So th for those of you who have seen the film, you understand. So she's an American. She um, has, you know, wanted to climb to a very, very specific place in, in, in her um, discipline. And, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Oz for classical music uh, is Berlin. So it had to be Berlin. And perhaps even the country more generally, I mean, in Germany, music is quasi-sacred. Um, and that is definitely, obviously, something that is becoming quite a haunting, actually, fact for the whole film and for the main character that um, Kate pl plays, um, Lydia Tau. But um, there, b before the music, perhaps next to the music, Lydia is in charge of this massive cultural institution that is the uh, Philharmonie. Um, how did you arrive at that understanding? I mean, that specific angle that she would have to bear the burden of being a public intellectual. When did that sort of come into the come into play in the script? Oh, immediately. I mean, um, this character was a character that I had been thinking about uh, for a very long time, uh, and not in any relationship to this particular cultural institution, but. I think at the time when I made my first notes about her, you know, like 10 years before I started the script, she was maybe running a, 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 a media organization or something like that. I don't even remember, to be honest with you. I, uh, but I had no place to put her, you know. Um, and then in March 2020, uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, uh, Focus Features, Peter Kajowski and Kiska Higgs said, um, would you be interested in doing something about classical music or, or a conductor? Uh, and I said, sure. And they said, OK, what do you want to do? And I said, I can't tell you. You have to trust me. Um, uh, you'll probably hate it, you know? But I, I, but I knew then that that's where I would put her, you know? Um, and, but the idea mainly um, was that she was sitting atop, as you say, a, a bureaucracy or a power structure. And that's what I was interested in, in terms of that character, was how could that character um, sort of have this journey to be able to have an audience be able to talk, walk around power and, and, and see how a power works and that it's not unidirectional, it's omnidirectional, you know? Um, and, and an orchestra, a, a cultural hierarchy like such as that is a perfect way of doing that because there's a front of house, there's the back of house, there's many, many different ways to, to sort of examine that. I, I guess what's fascinating when you take that angle is that the film is built as a sort of political allegory, um, in a way, because we have this figure at the center on the podium, very much like uh, you know, the early modern sovereign um, would be presiding over a city-state. And I'm always uh, you know, harkened back to the image of 
hubs is frontispiece with this sovereign towering over the, the populace, but composed of the citizens, right? And I think that's such an interesting way of looking at the orchestra. That she, Lydia Tarek, can't be without them, and yet she tries to dominate them. Kate, how did you um, approach such an obsessive figure? Yes, as you say, her instrument is a, is a human instrument. Um, and so it's, it's volatile and unpredictable. And, um, and of course, they're coming out of the pandemic having not had any chance to make any sound at all. Um, so there's a particular obsessive need to want to um, make up for lost time. But I thought it was a really fascinating setting um, you know, it's a, it's a classical music takes place in, a, in an atmosphere of, as you would know, Sophie, intense rigor and discipline and hours and hours and hours of practice. Um, you know, and then for, for those moments of inspiration, it's like you, you perfect a, a bar, a phrase, and then you play it again and you have to, you constantly have to return to your weak spots so that you can move across them with alacrity and um, and I think that that takes a particular type of um, application. And, you know, I'm, I remember my husband was reading a, um, a biography of Giacometti, and apparently during the wars he was estranged from his, um, his beloved, and he said, I'm going to return, but I'm working on something really, really important. And four years later he returned um, with four matchboxes full of dust, and so he ground it into the ground. And in a way, I sort of thought, I thought about that a lot with, with Lydia, you know, that she's, um, unbeknownst to her, even while she's conducting this funeral march, you know, this sort of, it's this destiny that, that she's trying to avoid meeting herself. She's, she's sort of grinding the joy out of what the thing that she once loved. So, yeah, it was fascinating. But it, in answer, a short, that was a very long-winded answer to your question. The short, the short answer is, um, I, I suppose I just had to run headlong into the music. And through the music, I, I suppose I hopefully began to approach this extraordinary creature that Todd had um, put on the page. And, and practice is perhaps a key word here, right? Because it's a philosophy of filmmaking that Todd offers through the film and that structures the way you approach the character as well. I mean, he insists on the fact that this is a rehearsal film and that, you, as you just said, you know, practice makes perfect. But what exactly went into that? And perhaps I can be even specificer here, I mean, really specific in terms of technique and your hands. To me, watching the film, it was so obvious that you'd found the character through her hands because of the importance of the motions to the conductor, but also in other instances, her nervousness, the effects of the pandemic, her shyness. I mean, there's something there that's so sharp in the way she says no to the world. Could you maybe say a bit more about that? Um, I, I, it was interesting not, not being a musician um, and not being a, uh, a conductor. I sort of, I found a liberation um, from my terror, frankly, uh, in the preparation through d watching dancers. And there's a, uh, a f friend of mine who's a choreographer here. I'd said, Have I, had I seen the work of Xavier Leroy? I said, no. And he w had watched Simon Rattle conduct The Rite of Spring. And he literally turned every gesture, every facial posture he made in, in the conducting of, of that e extraordinary work into a dance piece. And so I thought, oh, okay. I'm, I'm more of a dancer than a musician in a way, so you know I sort of live on stage, so I, I sort of lent into that, and um, it, it was it sort of freed me a bit from my terror, so that I could then watch conductors and realise that, that I could try and make it my own. Um, but but it's a little bit like we were talking about this today. It's not that these things are sex scenes, but when you think about a sex scene, you know there's a generic way of kissing, right? And and you have to the first thing you ask the director um, is what's this scene about? What are we trying to reveal about this relationship, about this person? Um, you know, otherwise it's just a sex scene, right? So there's a series of rehearsal. Um, moments, vignettes, and what can we reveal about the relationships to the orchestra? How are you going to shoot it? What, what does it say about the states that the characters are, are, are in? So once you treat them like scenes, then 
all of that preparation you've done, you just simply use them to communicate the scene, like you would with words. Um, and so once I sort of started to do that, then it sort of fed into the psychology um, and it had a purpose rather than just being me showing off my homework, you know, which would have been really boring. Um, perhaps one last question about the workings of Lydia Ter. I, um, I discovered a lot of things preparing for this um, interview, obviously, but one fascinating figure that I'd never really heard of at all is Antonia Brico. And I watched the documentary, the 1974 documentary that um, you mentioned, which is very painful, actually, um, to watch. She's an incredibly spirited woman who has enormous amount of energy and humor. She's, you know, a real force of nature in that way. But it is gut-wrenching to listen to her speak about not being able to conduct. And she has this wonderful sentence where she says it's a perpetual heartbreak. And I wonder to what extent, I mean, there, there are many figures that you look to to, to to create the character, Susan Sontag and John Didion, obviously, and you've talked about this elsewhere, but I do wonder whether Antonia was perhaps a key of sorts in any way. Well, she's name-checked, um, and so, of course, to my shame, I didn't know about her. And um, I watched, re it was one of the first things I did was watch that documentary, which is quite difficult to come by, but if you can watch it, it is It's on YouTube now. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> Everything's on YouTube. Um, uh, yes, it, it is, it was a real education because of course, you, if you're playing, we've said this a lot, um, but, but it's, um, it is a work of fiction. It's a, it's a fantasy, um, you know, that there's, I mean, Simone Young was extraordinary in what she achieved in Hamburg, but really there, I mean, um, Natalie Stutzman has taken over in, in Atlanta, and um, there's a Londra de Palma, and there's the extraordinary female conductors, but running what we have described as the, you know, the pinnacle of um, deep European orchestra, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. And, but it's, so it's important to, to look at the, the moment that, that would have led a, a, a creature like Lydia Tarr to be able to to take the podium, and so that was an important part of the the process. And all of those groundbreaking, heartbreaking, um, m missed opportunities, not by Antonia herself, but but by the the men who were running the institutions who didn't capitalise on her extraordinary talent, and the fact that she made her, made her own orchestra of of, of extraordinary mu um, musical strays. Anyway, she made music anyway. I mean, I think it's important for, just so you understand who she was, she had guest conducted with the BPO as a young woman, a young conductor, and was, ce and was celebrated instantly over here. And then she went to New York, and she was sort of turned into kind of a dog act. Um, and there was a, 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 a lot of well-heeled people in New York that decided that they were going to organize an orchestra for her of all female players. And, they, and she performed at Carnegie Hall, but again, it was this idea of single gender. And there was a certain point where she said, I've done that, now can I just play with the musicians I want to play with? And everybody that funded it said, similar to the film, sort of said, uh, if you do that, you'll probably lose your funding. And of course, that's what happened, so. And as you say, it feeds into the, into the film because Lydia's trying to move past that, right? She has the sponsorship program where she nurtures young talent and she has um, a meeting in a restaurant with the character played by, uh, with, with the character called Elliot Kaplan, where she wants to uh, uh, move past that, but there's something there that societally is no longer um, available. She's stuck with that identity uh, in a way, even though she's trying to perhaps think post-gender um, in terms of the art that she wants to, to foster. Um, Nina, is facing, facing Kate, um, this, I mean, facing Lydia, I must say, facing Lydia, <laughs> practically the same person to my mind now, um, facing Lydia is this very empathetic character named Sharon. And every time, Monica Villi cuts to you because the cut, the editing is so brilliant there in those scenes. The contrast between Lydia's autocratic impulses and your humane touch is a delight to behold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I 
it's, it's obvious to anyone who's seen you on stage or on screen, and I, I think particularly of Schwesterlein, which is one of my favorite films um, that was at Berlinale, um, recognizes that empathy as, as something that you do absolutely brilliantly. But I do wonder, if we just take a step back to the rehearsal process, at what point did you find the right tone, the right note for Sharon, and what was it like facing that sort of monstrous double that is Lydia, not Kate? <laughs> I'm not sure if you agree. <laughs> no. You know, I, I think I never know if I hit anything, you know. You just go for it and you try and you, like you, like Kate said, you grind down as deep as you can and you, like I said, when, like a little pig, look for the truffles in it, you know. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and, and I found that Sharon is so rich, you know. I, yeah, she has empathy. That's why she can... Bear, <laughs> Lydia, but also that's why she loves her because she's longing for what Lydia gives her. And it's something that she maybe even instigates, you know, in her because she, you know, in relationships, you fall in love because someone is the way they are. And then maybe after a while you start going, yeah, but don't do that. Don't, don't do that. And don't, do, you know, <laughs> and I think that's, where they are a little bit. Um, but on the other hand, like in this first scene, for example, I found the sentence from, from Todd where Sharon then says, uh, our daughter has some problems and I think she's kind of, uh, you know, reclusive and, and she has these blue marks on her shins. And, and I said, yeah, well, why don't you do something about it, Sharon? You know, no, she says it to Lydia and she knows what she's going to do. Sharon would never do it that way, but it's it's more effective, it's quicker, uh, and it works. <laughs> and, and so she knows exactly who she's dealing with, but it's also someone as a musician, um, and she encourages it. And But as a musician, I think what Sharon lacks is the free spirit and this freedom of going against rules, of of um, going f after her own interpretation, no matter what. Because Sharon has, in the position in the orchestra, is to be responsible for, for everyone, to be... Um, the concert master. Yeah, to be the concert master, to take, to be the translator for the conductor, f to, to kind of work with the group towards the sound that the conductor is, is looking for. So she has to be also a psychologist. And she has to be empathetic because she needs to feel the room. She needs to feel, uh, are the musicians okay? If someone has something going on, then you go there and you make them feel good and so that they can create in the best possible form. And um, yeah, so there is empathy in Sharon, but there's, uh, there's also, she's longing for something that she, that she can only get through through her, and that's why the loss is. Is it, is it great. recognition? What is it? What is she longing Sorry? for? Is it recognition? I mean, what is it that she's longing well, for? Well, partly, probably, I guess. I, I thought she would have never lived in the apartment that they live in, for example. <laughs> I think Sharon grew up in an apartment that, that is Lydia's music apartment you know that's probably that that's how we live now in berlin so this is this is <laughs> some of us and um, uh, some live in the bunker and <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and um yeah so so i think she has it's that but but i i truly believe that it, she is very much in love with lydia and she loves creating music, that's their passion. And to, to, to be able to experience that kind of work with someone who takes it just to another level is invigorating and exciting. And, uh, and I think that's what she's looking for. The only trouble is that Lydia thinks that love only lasts seven minutes, and that's her key. <laughs> As she, as, she, as she talks about Mahler, right? And that um, the way that she wants to look at Mahler is this understanding of love, but it's timed. So it resembles passion more than anything else, Yeah, perhaps. but also in that moment, she's avoiding int intimacy or exposure. I think the biggest thing about Lydia is that she's running from her own shadow, and so she doesn't want anyone to know her secrets, you know? And I think that there, that is something about... Um, musicians and performing artists is you can become incredibly superstitious and when you read a, a lot about conductors they don't their score 
and the notations. It's a little bit like someone finding your diary. You know, you don't, you don't want to, you can, where, you know, it's like when you talk about your process, it's like, uh, I'm only gonna talk about it so much because, not because I don't wanna talk about it to anybody else, I don't wanna articulate it to myself because there's a part of me that goes, well, if I, if I become conscious about how I make something, then maybe next time I try and make it, I'm gonna become self-conscious, which is the enemy of art, and I won't be able to do anything. So, you know, there's a, there's a you know, in, the, in that interview situation, there is a performative sense of self. So of course, the, the, the flip, I sound like I'm defending her, but you know, the seven minutes is like, I'm not, I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna give you my ma magic recipe. You know? um, I mean, Kate, you mentioned the um, composer's diary. Hildur, what did your diary for this film look like? <laughs> I mean, was it just, did you write Mahler down and then strike him out? <laughs> How did you compose for the film? Well, I don't really have a method, so I don't, that, that's the good thing about not having a method is that, that I don't have anything to share, really, that's always the same. <laughs> I, I really, um, I really try to, to, um, to change it up all the time, so, so whenever I start a new, especially a film, you know, which, which I think every film is, is such a universe in, in itself, and I, and I think, um, my superstition is that if I have a method, I'm doomed because then I then I always have to do the same Fair thing. Fair enough. But uh, Todd obviously brought you in at a point, at a very early point actually, which belies a rule in filmmaking and especially in Hollywood filmmaking. Perhaps could you yeah. maybe speak about the initial conversations you had and how music, understood as rhythm, is there in the film from the get-go in a way? Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, I was really, uh, I was really lucky to come in so early because we really got to, to talk about all the different aspects of, of, the, um, of the sound and the music and the psychology of rehearsing and the psychology of composing and this whole, you know, this is, that's a whole universe in itself. And, um, it was a really fun dialogue. It was an unusually fun dialogue. And, and obviously for me, who has dedicated my life to this specific process, you know, it was, it was really, really just, um, you know, like so fun and so invigorating. And, and so I guess it started with um, the initial conversations between me and Todd were like, you know, how he was affected by sound as he was writing the script and what he was listening to as he wrote and then we um you know he was he was really affected by by his uh, father-in-law's uh, um, medical alarm which he brought to me in, in berlin he brought this alarm so 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 as as he did that what you know I'm, I'm bringing that into the music as well because you know all the sounds they affect the music and and all the music, you know, as, as a musician or as a composer, as, as we are writing or rehearsing something, it overtakes us, you know. So, so, you know, the music is not just happening when we're rehearsing, it's happening all the time, you know, as we're doing the dishes, as we're walking around, as we're sleeping, you know. So, so I thought it was really important that we have that also in the, um, we had the same understanding, like, you know, the, all of us who were working on the film, we had an understanding of what the tempo of, of that inner music was, you know, because because this is the music that you don't see around musicians. It's the invisible layer that that follows us around, like this this hovering ghost, you know, and it it, it affects us, you know. So so a lot of the music that that I wrote was written for that for our temple mapping that we did of the of the of the script, and then there was also the music that uh Lydia is writing in the film that Which I was called for Petra. Wrote. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. We we only hear a few ghostly notes, right? That um Lydia and Olga, played by Sophie, um play out for us. But maybe could you tell us a little bit about composing that fragment? I mean it feels it reminds me of, you know, the Sappho in a way. It's just we've got this tiny little thing exactly. that hangs there and then is gone. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was really, you know, it was it was so interesting to write music um, for someone else that's writing, you know, for a completely different person uh, than 
than myself, but also to write music for, for Lydia Tarr, because I think the, the music that she's writing tells us so much about the, the disconnect and the turbulence that she's experiencing, experiencing in, in, in this point of her life, because she's created this giant persona, which is this conductor, and the music that she's, you know, that she's performing there is very, you know, has a lot of bravo. But then we also know that, that she, you know, she goes to the Amazons and she does field recordings and she's very explorative. She's supporting all these young uh, um, composers and, and, uh, and, and in her hearts of hearts probably wants to be much more ex ex explorative in her music. And, and she is, you know, when she's writing, she's much more fragile, you know. So it was a really interesting thing to try to, to, try to portray uh, through the music, this this disconnect without being too um, too literal about it, you know, and and to do it in this kind of because we only have this certain amount of space and and time for this insight into her character through the music. So it was it was really like an interesting way to to work on the um, on this music, yeah. And then Todd, I mean, Hildur has just mentioned that you were obsessively listening to music um, when writing the script. Was it classical music? I mean, what did you, you could you mention a few of the titles and how they sh perhaps shaped certain scenes even? Um, sure. Um, <laughs> I, one, one thing I should say though first um, is that um, I think it's important to mention that the theme that for Petra Hildur, when she finished reading the script, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, she just picked up her phone and she sang that theme wholesale, like as a reaction to her reaction to, to the story. Um, and that recording is the recording that Lydia Tarr is hearing when she's following Olga down into the subterranean place. That's the same recording. It's off the it's iPhone. Voice memos, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, there, there's a kind of a, a, a beginning to end in terms of a full circle in terms of the moment she started thinking about it, which I think is um, is interesting. Um, what was I listening to? I was listening to a lot of stuff. I mean, I wasn't listening to a lot of um, concert music. I was listening to Gureshki, uh, uh, specifically this Kronos Quartet uh, piece, and um, that I had been obsessed with since I don't know ninety one, ninety two, whenever it came out, and. Uh, I'd listened to that a great deal. We called it the Tar March. Fantasia. Yeah, Fantasia. And, and, and Hildur had said, what were you listening to? And I said that. And she said, okay, well, that's her inner tempo, 120 beats per minute. And then she started writing other music that we could, we could play on set or that Kate could have in her ear if she wanted that was, that was at that gate. So, um, I mean, I listened to, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you everything I listened to. I had a, a few playlists depending on where I was in the script. K-pop. K-pop, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Banyan style, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to the TikTok videos of that. Um, so, um, Sophie, playing an actor, I mean, acting as a cellist, what was that like? Because as much as Lydia is at a loss with herself and is sort of losing any sense of self, you come along as Olga, so determined and assured and with such a coherent sense of who you are and you thwart her tempo in such an interesting way. Could you tell us how you arrived at that gusto, in a way, that we see in the restaurant scene so brilliantly acted out? Well, first of all, thank you. That was really kind of you to say. And um, secondly, I had two very lovely um, people who guided me to the character, Todd and Kate. They sp we spent a lot of time discussing Olga um, and kind of her history and, um, yeah, I guess her thoughts and feelings. Um, but I've always been very interested in people and what makes them tick or their emotions. My mom's a psychologist, so I've always grown up with that. Um, so I was really fascinated when I got to read the screenplay for the first time. I, I felt like um, it would be incredibly liberating to play Olga. You know, as you mentioned, she's 
quite fearless. And what I really admire about her is she really doesn't worry about the consequences whatsoever. Um, not something I'd say that I, I uh, can relate to, but um, I've definitely learned a lot from her. But um, no, it was, it was so much fun to play a character who, who just um, is, uh, I wouldn't say she's carefree, but yeah, she's, she's um, uh, I think Todd calls her quite ferocious. I remember that word being in the script a lot and her playing as well. That was kind of the hardest thing for me to actually embody another character while playing the cello to really think how Olga would kind of, um, kind of throw herself at the piece. Um, I definitely wouldn't play the Elgar like that necessarily, um, which was why it was so lovely to record the concept album about half a year later, because then I got to um, have a go at the Elgar as me. Um, but yeah, she really goes at everything with kind of, uh, I like to say, with the blood, and um, really kind of attacks it and gives it so much passion and kind of, um, yeah, a, a, like she's kind of a bit of a force of nature. So um, I learned a lot from Olga. I miss her a lot. It was lovely to live with her for half a year. Um, so thank you, Todd. <laughs> and in, in many ways, she's a younger version of Lydia. I mean, that is what is haunting in a way when she cuts through um, Lydia's life and um, these concentric paths that Lydia's own, she just sort of beelines and messes things up so so interestingly. But I mean, Sophie, you just mentioned this this album, and it does say something about this film and toward your way of constructing not so much the one film that is called Tur, but this constellation of objects that gravitate around it, from the album to the film that we're going to see in a, in a few seconds. Was that always um, the case? Did you always imagine that beyond this center of gravity that is to her, you would have these satellites? I was just happy to get a film made, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, a, lo a lot of, I mean, the film is about process, um, but everybody on this stage that came along uh, took that idea and bested it and took it beyond, you know? I mean, Kate very early on said, um, we need to experiment. We need to have our own process within the process. We need to have process for its own sake and process that um, maybe no one will ever see but us, but it's a worthy exercise. So we did many things, you know. Um, uh, some things that um, are suggested in the film, some things that no one will ever see, but were very, very valuable for our process of making the film. In terms of the concept album, that was a conversation that uh, Hilda and I had from day one, you know, which was, wouldn't it be great? You know, and that was really Hilda's idea. What, what if we had a concept album? What if we, what if Lydia Tarr actually gets her Deutsche Grammophon cover? And, and she had that idea at the very, when I first arrived here in Berlin, um, and I said, well, that will never happen. They'll never let us do that. And Hilda said, no, no, we're, let's do this. We're going to make it happen. And, and, and to use your word, she was ferocious about it. So. Um, very stubborn. Yeah, very <laughs> stubborn. Thank, thankfully, yeah, no one would listen to me. You know, so um, I mean, and that continued on through. You know, I, I mean, there, like I said, many things, and and that, that's where I think, um, for me, you know, uh, when I think about this film, uh, you know, from a, a distance soon, um, that's what I'll really take away from it is that the sense of play and the sense of discovery that we all had together, um, that in the making of the film, in the, in the making of, of everything, to try to get ourselves attenuated to, to that idea of, of actively being involved with process that wasn't you know, performative, that wasn't just about the film itself. Which comes out of your training as a jazz musician, does it not? I mean, does it bear that, that notion that, you know, when you're with talented peers, you can just have fun? Right. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, this is a, it's a gendered term, but the term that they use in jazz is sidemen or leader, you know? But the best bands, there are no sidemen or leaders, there's just players. And, and those are magical bands. Those are the, the storied bands like VSOP and that. And you never talk about 
anyone individually, you talk about the players, you know, and, and that's exactly what we had here, you know. It was, it was a very, very special experience, you know, and, uh, and probably not repeatable and sort of yeah. vaguely tragic, you know, because... <laughs> I think that's the beautiful thing about film, we can repeat it on screen and actually we can now watch this gift that I mentioned that's called the fundraiser. Um, would you like to maybe just say a few words about that in terms of the experimentation that Yeah, gave so birth this to? is, um, first of all, um, I would ask for your assistance in, uh, in turning off all your phones right now, all of them. Um, and I'm, and I mean, it's, uh, this is, this is a, a piece of our experimentation uh, that only everyone in this room w will experience. No one else will ever see it. So, uh, uh, lucky. <laughs> so the idea behind this was, let's throw a party for her, um, and or, or rather, sharing good now. Um, Let's is planning this party, uh, and and that's enough said. If you've seen the film, you'll understand uh, the idea behind it. it. This was a conversation early on that Kate and I had, which was um, a sort of fantasia, you know, a sort of uh, down the rabbit hole, uh, a tea party with a with 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 a top hat, you know, um, this sort of fever dream after she sees the black dog, you know, kind of thing. And um, we thought, you know, we were looking for opportunities to do it and we, we started working on it. We kind of knew very, very early on that it was just an experiment. But we had it scheduled so we got to finish it anyway. <laughs> um, so so um, Monica Willie and I, um, uh, we never had it in the, you know, we never used any of it. And then when we were, when we'd finished, uh, she said, what about, what about the fundraiser? We should put it together. And we did. And um, when we were mixing at Abbey Road, all our sound crew there, Debadere and everyone said, oh, we have to finish this. This is, this is fantastic. Uh, I said, I know, but I don't, I don't, we don't have any place to show it. It's not really meant to be, to be shown. But when we found out we were coming to Berlin, we thought, ah, this is it. So, um, so it's. So just before we go to the world premiere of the fundraiser, uh, like Ariel, Hildur has to leave us and go back to the skies to compose more music. So please join me in thanking her for gracing the stage with her presence again. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we'll leave you with the film and be back in about 10 minutes' time. Yep, yeah. about 10 minutes. Yep. Um, and really, it is, there's so few intimate moments in life. And we're on, we're on a theatre stage, I'm sitting on a revolve. And when you're on stage, there's an energy transference between what happens here and what happens with you guys. It's a circle that's completed. And when you, can, you keep performing, but you know someone's pulled their phone out. And you know that what ha this magic that we all create together out of its context, the magic spell's broken. So I really do ask you, we're inviting you into a very intimate thing because we made this film here. So please, 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 let's keep this secret between us. <laughs> So I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, and we can welcome our film team back on stage. Todd Field. <laughs> Nina Hoss. <laughs> Sophie Cower. <laughs> and Kate is gonna, Kate is gonna join us in a little second. 
Too bad. I guess we're starting without uh, one of the members of the ensemble, but congratulations <laughs> on what is a beautiful... So what do you guys think? <laughs> it's just us, you know? Um, now you're part of the process, so it keeps going, you know? Um, uh, that, was, that was really fun and, and, and bittersweet, you know? Why bittersweet? Uh, because I'll never see it projected again. You know? <laughs> yeah. Is it really meant to be a sort of ephemera in a way, sort of like a magic lantern moment where it's just gone? Yeah, just yeah, absolutely. a flummery, we flummery. call it. Yeah, but we had a lot of fun, as you can see. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty obvious. I mean, Todd, when you were introducing the film, you mentioned that it was a sort of fever dream moment. And what's fascinating to hear, actually, is the change in musical choices, because we have all of a sudden this piece from Ravel and the Bolero, which turns this bal masque or masquerade into a sort of, I don't know, wounded animal scene. I mean, I, I feel like Lydia is here a bit like a, a bull in a, in a social arena that she doesn't want to be in, and then yet everything's so fun. Can you maybe say a few words about this, the contradictory um, registers that course through the, this, this short film between comedy and tragedy, perhaps even? Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it, there's a, there, there are many things going on in this short film. I mean, I mean um, the idea behind the process was, on the one hand, um, exploring this marriage, this relationship between Sharon Goodnow and, and Lydia Tarr, you know, and the deep, deep love that they share for real. And also the very, um, uh, the connection to these players. I mean, everyone in that room, most of the orchestras in that room, you know, um, which was great fun for all of us. Um, but there's, it's also very much sort of like a, uh, a throwback kind of the idea of a romantic scene between two people, even the, what they're dancing to, they're dancing to the, the Wiener Blood or the, the Blood Waltz you know, with Von Karian conducting the BPO and, um, uh, and even the sort of way that they're talking to each other is very much like, it, you know, a, a 1930s MGM musical and, um, you know, and I mean, with this with a smashed in face, you know, uh, and, and the idea that it's beautiful to a point, but there's a there's a part when she's looking across the hall when she sees the the managing director of the orchestra um, and her and her predecessor, um, where there's a moment of doubt and and this idea of do, does she surrender to this moment? Does she continue in this moment, um, or does she want to get away from it? You know, um, and and this moment it's one of my favorite moments uh, uh, is, is when, you know, when Kate goes to the mirror and she's sort of looking at herself and sort of, you know, she's, she's you know, um, everything's still kind of beautiful until it's not, you know, this idea, so, well, uh, the wounds are kind of pretty, you know, um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and, then, and then realizing she has to get away from everyone, you know, and, and, uh, and, then, and then she goes into this other piece of this Fantasia, which is, um, sort of sitting with this idea that something is about ready to be over for her, you know, something that uh, she's climbed a mountain, um, you know, much like the film, you know, and she's thinking about legacy. She's, she, she's kind of, she's hearing her past from a distance, a sort of insistent, relentless, driving, you know, paradiddle on the snare drum of, of, of Ravel's Bolero. Um, and then she comes across a very different version, like you do in dreams, of, of, um, of Olga, uh, who's very, very different than she is in the film. She's like Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream, you know? Um, and, they, and, it, and, and that plays out very much like A Midsummer Night's Dream until it doesn't because somebody's had too much to drink and they're barfing on the ground, you know? And then she goes back up into the other world, you know? So um, it was an idea with sort of taking her through this sort of strange, fantastic sort of tour of pleasures, um, but also as a way, you know, um, in a sort of archetypical way uh, to, to sort of 
play with these relationships, the, the other side of these relationships, you know, um, uh, the unconscious part of, of the character. But if Lydia is a sort of Oberon, then she doesn't quite meet her Titania anymore. I mean, this is a very touching moment um, as a satellite object or even part of the film, if you want to take it in that, because we do see this couple and their love. And we actually see Lydia laugh and smile, which is something that's really rare in the film and so different to you as a person, Kate, and uh, you know your stage presence and, and everything that goes around it. I, I do find that to be quite fascinating. And when she looks into, uh, into the mirror, as you were just mentioning, Todd, and smiles in this forced manner, there's something that's, that mask keeps on coming, slipping in and off. Could you maybe say a bit about, about that? aspect of the character and how would you would what's at stake yeah it was something i mean that we talked about a lot you know the inner life of the character and i think f for me what i found most interesting because it obviously for those of you who've seen the film it's a process film it's not a performance film so we're talking a lot about process and um i find having you know spent many hours on stage that there's something that happens a deepen deepening of the understanding of a character over time which you rarely get on film. What happens if you're lucky, you get to rehearse. And what happens is you rehearse in pre-production and then you perform. And we, we thought, well, we're making a process movie, so why don't we keep the process alive? How do you, you know, keep the experimentation alive? And there was something, because the, she's going through a state of transformation, from which you, you, you do as an artist, particularly mid-career artist. You, you crash and burn, you stop working, or you push too far into success until your, your art becomes incredibly thin. You know, you have to go through some sort of crucible um, in order to keep making work. And so part of that, there was a kind of a metaphor in her turning 50. And so we talked about viscerally understanding what that experience would be. And so for me, it's, it's almost like, because this was part of the process, the, the turning 50, the physical transformation, as well as the metaphorical transformation that she's undergoing, was so alive for me within the character because we'd been through that process. And I've never, ever had that on film. And um, even though we knew this would never be seen, we all understood that this was alive in the relationship. It was alive, you know, the notion, the notion between reality and the muse. And so, you know, people have talked about Lydia as being a predator, and I, I thought, well, no, it's just like, she's a muse. And I thought, well, there's no right or wrong reading of the film. Um, but, you know, that was, this was so alive for me as, as, as part of uh, who the character actually was, and that the tragedy was that the success and the influence and the authority and the power had made the, the kind of the responsibility or the, or the outward facing mask so thick that she no longer had access to that play and that joy and that ease that you have when you, when you are light off into your career as an artist without, as you were saying earlier, a, a sense of consequence. You have such a healthy lack of consequence, an outcome, everything's part of a process. But when you, when you stand up there as a principal conductor, they want results. They want to see a performance. And so what happens to failure? What happens to experimentation? What happens to play and joy and you know, open-ended conversation? You know, things that go nowhere, games. You know? And so that's, that's all alive in, in Lydia. But because she's about to, you know, she, in a way, she has to destroy herself in order to refine that aspect of her. But, I, but viscerally understanding it, you know, it was very much alive, it, although it, albeit dormant and, um, for her, you know, for me inside the character in the film that we ultimately see. Um, and I guess that's very much alive to you as actors. Um, Nina in particular, I mean, Nina and Kate, your career has obviously taken um, a lot of incarnation. I mean, you've incarnated so many roles for the screen, but you are theatre actors as well, and I wonder to what extent that has played in and fed the joy in which, with which you perform this piece, but also in the movie um, in Tower itself. Um, I think perhaps one specific point in, uh, um, to just 
frame the question a little bit more is the way in which Todd films interiors and the couple's apartment in particular. They're filmed in much the same way as auditoriums or the stage scenes are, right? These oneers that go in and follow them as they walk around. And we saw it again here in the legacy of Eyes Wide Shut is, is, is obviously you know, a ghost, a beautiful ghost that hovers over the film. But I do wonder whether that, 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 that notion of, of a one shot or a one take was something that was alive for you, Nina, and how you drew energy even from it. Well, it's then, it, it becomes a sort of dance also, you know. So that element comes to it with, uh, for example, we did this, I think the only one shot I had was the last scene, I, I guess. And uh, so it does something to the way you only have that much time, for example. You, you know you got to arrive at a certain point so that the camera is ready, but then you want to be very free and explorative in the moment. So you gotta, it's, it is then about having a long breath. <laughs> yeah, and that's theater. <laughs> that's to have the long breath and to know some moments it goes like this and this is okay and then it comes back up again and then it, you know, this, uh, and I think that was so beautiful with Kate because I think we met actually through this, having done theater, having done the same roles also. She even played Groß und Klein, where I still think, how, why Groß und Klein? <laughs> but I do understand, because the character is phenomenal. Um, and Hedda, and so on. And, and I, I think that, that if you feel that you're very much, it felt like very much at ease to explore those, those things, because we knew the language somewhat without having to say anything. And Kate, I mean, one of the other... Um embodiments of um, beautiful fem female figures on stage that, you, that you've that you done in the past, I think I'm not wrong in saying is Blanche in Streetcar, who's also a character who's running away from things and her past in particular. And I wonder whether you could maybe, and before I open the f um, to questions from the floor, maybe talk about perhaps this illness that Lydia suffers from and which we hear mentioned at the beginning of the fundraiser as well, which is to say nostalgia. Nostalgia, yeah. But she mispronounces it and says nostalgia, doesn't she? Yeah. yeah. Perhaps you could speak to that, Todd. Okay, Todd. <laughs> Low-hanging fruit. Um, um, well, I mean, that is, that, that is the technical term, and when some, oftentimes, when somebody falls on their face, there's a twisting of the neck, and there's a nerve uh, damage that happens. Um, where there's a burning sensation on the shoulder, where it feels like you've fallen asleep in the sun or something like that, where it, it, you can't even put a, a shirt on, it hurts so much. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's the medical term for it. Um, uh, and as the doctor rightly says, there's no treatment for it, um, other than that perhaps she's somewhat crooked and could use an adjustment. Um, uh, but the only, Yeah, the only solution is time. Time, <laughs> that's right, the only solution is time, exactly. But I, but uh, Which perhaps rolls back into the idea of nostalgia. And, you know, yeah. yeah, but I, perhaps just I mean at the risk of laboring this point, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what's fascinating to me in understanding Lydia is when she finally does return home, and we find out that she's maybe called Linda, right? So that that nostalgia is actually a not in this movie, not in this one, <laughs> not in this one. But I but I do wonder. It does offer a different dimension to the character to know that she's perhaps the product of immigrant parents who've come to America with a different music in mind, a different set of cultural values, a different yearning. And so perhaps we could conclude on that point because I do think it is what makes the tragedy even more specific and fascinating in a way, that historical dimension. Yeah, I mean, well, that, I mean, None of that's, I mean, that's important in terms of our conversation, in terms of building the character, in terms of executing the character, but, um, um, and you're, you're feeling, uh, I, you're getting a sense of it, hopefully, um, when she returns home to her, her Staten Island beginnings, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the idea was here, you know, there's something about, um, a lot of times you meet people at the very, very top of a discipline and there are people that have no 
the odds are so great that this person would be there. I think we're taught from a very young age that there's an industrial sort of accepted path that we're supposed to take to, for success. Um, and I think the danger of that is um, knowing too much. And if you're someone that comes from a very different background that is, in this case, um, someone that has no relationship to uh, concert music and no relationship to any of that at all, and that the only sort of um, activation for them coming from immigrant parents, coming from you know the idea where an accordion was the only instrument you were put in, with, put in your hands as a child, um, you know, and dancing polkas at social clubs or something in, out in Staten Island, is that once you see this window of, ah, that's it, that's it, that you can chase something with a kind of passion because you don't know how impossible it is. And if you were raised in a family, like Sharon, for instance, she's the exception to that rule. She was raised around music. She was raised around players. Her sister worked at Deutsche Grammophon, all of these sort of, that's Sharon's backstory. She could probably get as high as a concert master, and that's, a, that's an incredible position for her to be in at, within this orchestra. But for someone, and this is a fairy tale because we don't have any female examples of this, unfortunately, of somebody running a, a major German orchestra as a chief conductor, um, but for an American specifically, we have a concert master. We have now. a concert master now. Yes, yes at the BPO. <laughs> uh, for the first time in 141 years, just announced. Um, but um, but to, but to have someone like Lydia Tarr, you, you know, reach these heights, she would have to almost come from such a humble background to where it's somebody that's chasing a dream, and it really is a dream. I mean, the odds are so stacked against a character like this, and I think that. That's an important thing to understand about the character because as is, is much as this is an examination of, about power, it's also a character study, which is what it's cost this little girl that fell in love with this music and, and, and got just this far beyond her, her grasp. You know, uh, it, it was, you know, her reach was exceeded by her grasp. And, um, and now she's sitting apart atop this power structure, you know, which was not part of that childhood dream. The childhood dream was all about making noise and being fabulous, you know. Um, and and now she's in a very much a HR situation where she has to manage this power structure and she has to manage other people. And maybe she's not particularly good at that. And maybe that had nothing to do with her dream at all, you know. Mm. And it's what's costing her her dream to a certain extent. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions from the floor, um, which could be obviously about the fundraiser as well. So maybe my, no, no one has a mic in the room. Yeah, they do. Okay, up there. I think we have one person on the balcony just here. I, I'll please, please keep your questions short and to the point so that we can get as many as we can in. Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll try. Um, my question is both to Todd and Kate. I think Todd said in one of many interviews that he um, that you wrote this character specifically in Kate with mind. So my question would be, what in Kate as actress made you want to do that, to write it for her and with her? And to Kate, I am about to see Todd for the first time tonight, but from the oh shit, spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing was a ter terrible spoiler alert. Um, but from little promotion videos that I've already seen. Um, there are definitely a couple of parallels to you, Jasmine and, and Blanche. So my question to you would be... Um, so two questions. Ooh, you're greedy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that was um, not the deal. Uh, anyways, um, the, the rest... <laughs> anyway. uh, Sasha hustle to get a ticket here. Um, anyways, the question is, uh, would you... You're obviously a very versatile actress, but um, would you say this this type of Blanche Duesque uh, roles, both a goofball and a tragic heroine, this is your favorite type to play? Do you answer the first question? Let's just get mine. You could go online. I've said it a million times. Um, <laughs> she was cheap. I was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> was not an expensive but film. But not easy. <laughs> <laughs> Just liquor her up and just <laughs> cut her loose, you know. Uh, um, <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, uh, yes. Yes. Yep. Um, Kate and I had met 
uh, one evening uh, b about 10 years before I started the script on, a, on another film that, that I wanted to make, uh, a script that I'd written with Joan Didion, um, and we felt very strongly about Kate, and we were thrilled when she agreed to meet. Um, that, if anyone who sat in dialogue with Kate will tell you this, which is, um, you're not ready for that. Uh, uh, she's really, you know, one of the great intellectuals you'll ever encounter. And don't, <laughs> yeah, stop, don't do that. She's gonna, she's gonna, she, she, Can we, uh, next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but I, you know, I, I left that meeting just, you know, so excited, and Joan was excited too, but unfortunately that project never came together. So um, when I started, when I sat down to, to write this script, and I never write for actors um, for reasons that I think were probably pretty understandable, I write characters, uh, but she wouldn't leave my sight. I, I couldn't get her out of my head. So. Um, I had to accept that, you know, um, because I was really setting myself up for an incredible failure and disappointment in so much as I, we hadn't spoken in 10 years. We didn't know each other particularly well. We had one single meeting, and I had no hope that she would want to do this because there are all kinds of reasons for her to say no, you know. So uh, when she said yes, I mean, you know, I was thrilled and, and terrified uh, because how was I possibly going to to keep up with her, you know? And the question is, you can't. <laughs> I guess the second question was about tragedy, oh, but... Yeah, look, I, mean, I, mean, I, think I, too, I too was thrilled and terrified. I mean, you don't, you don't get opportunities to play roles like this very often, nor do you get the opportunity to play Lottegotter or Hedda Gabler or uh, Blanche Dubois, but there's no point in playing those roles. Like, there's no point in playing Hamlet unless you have a fabulous Gertrude, an amazing Claudius, unless you have a director who's gonna inviscerate that play and know exactly why they wanna tell that story right now. Um, it, otherwise, it's just a, a vanity exercise um, and you may as well just sit in a rehearsal room and learn the lines. So it's about being in dialogue with the director and the other actors. So, um, you know, um, Blanche Dubois, it's because Liv Ullmann was directing it, you know, um, and Hedda Gabler, it's because my husband had done this extraordinary adaptation which brought the play, uh, the, you know, to, to life. So that, that's why, and, and Todd was why this one. And then, of course, Nina and Sophie and everyone, yeah. Thank you. Short and sweet. Okay, I'll try. This is on. Oh, hi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Short and sweet. Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, hi, my name is Uzamaka. I'm from Nigeria, and Kate uh, Blanchett is paying attention to me. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, um, so I'm just in awe of the presence that you command on screen. Like, every single time I watch, it's just mind-blowing. And I just wanted to know if you are aware that you command such presence on screen. <laughs> um, truly, I want to know. News to her. And if you do know, do, do you take any steps to ensure that you don't overshadow other people on screen? No, I'm, I'm being honest because, yeah, because um, sometimes, you know, when you watch certain things, it's like you know that people are trying to be the star of the, of the thing, of the scene, but with you, it's not, you're not trying to be the star of the thing, you're just, you just own the thing. Okay, I think we get the point. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's called a close-up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, if, if they go in, it'll be, yeah. Um, I don't quite know how to answer that question. I think it's, look, I worked very, my, for the first time I, was, I did theatre in England, I was on the West End, and it was quite a brutal experience. And I worked with a very older actor who's since passed away, extraordinary. But um, in the previews, he did a thing. And as he exited, for some reason, I, we were all on stage, and the audience would erupt into applause. And then it kept happening every preview. And um, the, the, the director came back, and he was furious at him. And there's a thing you can do, apparently, which I've never learned, where you can elicit um, its look or, a, or a, a speed which you exit off stage, which can elicit, it's like, it's like a magic trick, a response from an audience. It's like a wink. 
And, uh, and I found that such a bizarre thing to do. It's like an attention-grabbing moment. And I, it's sort of, it's, I think it's probably a generational thing, but it's antithetical, I think, to the way we all work. And this is very much, you know, um, even though I had more lines, it was very much an ensemble feeling, and that comes from... Todd, the director, you know, it was like this, the crew were our first audience, but they were all part of the process. It's just that some of us are in front of the camera and some of us are behind. But it's like, I think we all treated the, the filmmaking process a bit like a revolve. It's just that, you know, we happen to be in the front. So the only way I can do it, because you do become incredibly self-conscious very quickly, and I'm not, I am, a, I mean, I know I'm talking a lot now, but this is the act. Like, I'm quite shy, actually. And so the only way I, when I first started out, that I could even approach being looked at by a camera was to imagine that the lens was looking at the person who was off camera. So the camera was never looking at me. Um, and that's the, it, it, the more you do, the worse that feeling gets. So it's a trick that, that you have to do. When you stand off stage, every night, even on the 120th performance, you have nerves, and those nerves are useful because that's adrenaline and that's energy, and that means you're taking a risk and you're going to risk discovering something new and maybe it not working. You have to have those nervous, that nervousness, and I think if you don't, then it's time to stop. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, though, but, yeah. I think we have time for one more, and I've given it to the young man at the bottom. Please keep it short, please. please. Uh, hi, so my question is for Mr. Field. Uh, so throughout Tor, there are instances where the ghost of Lady Has Passed becomes something more than figurative. They're spatialized, in a sense. And uh, so I was wondering at what point when you were uh, coming up with Tar, did the idea of the hauntological or spectrality come in? Was that something that was always part of the film? Yes. Um, <laughs> it was always part of the film and it was always about how to treat it, you know? Um, and how is this character, how are things manifesting for her, you know? Um, the first time, like she's feeling something, something's coming, something's inevitable, you know, and the first time you really feel that and the first time that you, hopefully you don't hear it, but you feel Hilda's score come in is when she's in the Carlisle Hotel, there's a moment she's brushing her hair and that's it, right? And the, ga the game's afoot then. That's really where the film starts. And um, again, going back to this film that we only us have seen, um, that's sort of part of sort of a dream within a dream. So when this long wonder between uh, Sophie and Kate, uh, when she says, my friend Anna, you know, she won't leave. And she's leaning in and she's saying, do you still see her? That's what she's thinking about, right? This idea that um, there's something there. There's something, you know, um, bothering her. And whether we're, where that's coming from, uh, in, you know, is up for grabs. But, but it's very real for her. But this was all a dream. That's all we have time for tonight. But please join me in welcoming thank you, thank you. Sophie Coward, Kate Blanchett, Nina Hoss, and Todd Field. <laughs>